Welcome everyone. We are very glad that you can join us today. My name is Laura Jones and I'm the Northwest Regional Coordinator of the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I will be the host and question moderator for today's webinar, History at Your Fingertips, Using Hoosier State Chronicles and Indiana Memory, presented by Justin Clark, Public Historian and Digital Initiative Director at the Indiana Historical Bureau, a division of the Indiana State Library. After the webinar has been transcribed, it will be available on the Indiana State Library's archived webinars page. If you're watching an archived recording of this presentation, information on how to obtain your TLEU is in the video's description in YouTube. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to the Indiana State Library's e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word, and check our continuing education website for other professional development opportunities. All right, let's get started. I'm now happy to turn the presentation over to Justin Clark. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me um, on this, you know, day before Thanksgiving, um, wherever you may be, if you're either in the office or if you're at home. Um, hope you're staying warm and safe. Um, I know it's a little blustery and chilly out there. So, um, so yeah, so today we're going to be talking about um, Indiana Memory and Hoosier State Chronicles, which are two uh, major digital initiatives here at the Indiana State Library. And I'm going to kind of walk you through what these program projects are, how long they've been around, kind of the ins and outs of them, and then I'm also going to kind of show you how to use them a little bit. So first we're going to start with Indiana Memory. Um, so what is it? Um, Indiana Memory launched in 2008 and it is a digital platform for Indiana's cultural heritage. Um, this is something that we do in conjunction with libraries and cultural heritage institutions across the state. And we have the web portal that provides access. So um, to, your, to your left there, you'll see that's the front page of Indiana Memory. If you've never been there, it's kind of what it looks like. We have collections from all across the state of Indiana from over 150 partners, um, over 400 collections, um, 500,000 items Put it on your across the presentation. state. presentation? Yeah. Can you guys see it? Okay. All right, cool. Um, okay, where was I? Okay, so uh, 500,000 items. And then one thing that we just recently switched to is a brand new version of Content DM, which is our content management system. Um, it's called Content DM Responsive. The reason it's called Responsive is because it's now, um, uh, it's now more easily uh, used on mobile devices. So if you're using it on a phone, or if you're using it on an iPad or some kind of other kind of tablet or anything like that, it works a little bit better there. And it provides um, a lot better um, front end um, capabilities for users. It's, it's really, really nice. And I'll kind of show you what it looks like. Um, like I said, we have a web interface where all this kind of comes together, integrated features. So you can search across different collections. You can search across different types of items and you can search across different kinds of um, sort of contributors as well. We also harvest stuff um, from non content DM sources. So an example of that is Indiana Album, um, which is this incredible consortium that exists here in the state. Um, uh, that's sort of a public private partnership that um, that uh, digitizes um, items from across the state, um, but they use a different system than we do. They use something called Past Perfect, um, but we can harvest their material for um, Indiana Memory as well. So again, this is the Indiana Memory homepage, um, and it kind of gives you a few different kind of things down there at the bottom. So you have collections across Indiana, so it kind of shows you all the different ones that we've got. Our newspapers, which I'll get to in here in a little bit. Um, teacher resources as well as collection lists. It kind of gives you a sense of what we've got there. And then we also highlight some things on the front page as well. So we have this like steamboat mini haha -ha on Lake Wawasee. Um, this is part of the Syracuse Wawasee Digital Archives. Um, and, uh, and so we have a bunch of different things that kind of show up there. So we have search results. Um, we have sort of faceted results, sorting capability, and then you can view the thumbnail, title, description, and subject. So let's say you're searching for somebody like Henry Knox, and then you'll sort of pull up what we've got. Um, and then once you click on an individual item, it'll actually show you um, uh, some of the metadata that's associated with that object. So it'll show you the description, it'll show you sort of the date that it comes from, and then it'll also include the original source link. So when you click on that, it'll take you to actually where it is, um, which is a part of the um, Indian Historical Society collections. 
It'll also provide you some similar items on the left-hand side. And then when it says faceted results, basically you can, you can narrow your search by collection, you can narrow it by institution, you can also narrow it by like suggested topics and also by time period. So if you're looking into something in particular and you want something from like 1940 to 1950, you can click that as a decade um, as a facet of that as well. This is, um, this is a, what a, an object will look like in Indiana memory, specifically content DM. Um, this is from our genealogy collection. Um, and, uh, and so it has a front and a back. It's a photograph, um, photographic, I think postcard or photographic image of Abel, Jay, and Deborah Sinnott. Um, we have all kinds of different really neat genealogy resources here at the State Library, and then a lot of them have been digitized um, for patrons. So it's a really great resource for people who are doing genealogy research that we have this entire genealogy collection that people can benefit from, that they can search um, Indiana memory to get a sense of, alongside all of the other collections that we have too. So uh, the new version of Content DM Responsive has this really great feature where it sort of pulls out the image itself. The old Content DM uh, used to be sort of like the image would sort of display halfway across, halfway you know, across the bottom of the screen, you wouldn't see the whole image. Um, but the new version of Content DM does a really good job of being able to basically pull out the image itself and then you can kind of look at it, you can zoom in and out. Um, and then you can, on, then on some collections, depending on access, you can download the image too. Um, I believe on these, we can we let you download. Um, some, col uh, some collections, some of our partners don't, but more often than not, you can download the image and you can download different sizes depending on what size you want. Um, which is pretty fun too. And I, I always really like that option because especially if you're like saving it for later and you have something you want to look at later on, especially if it's like a manuscript collection or something of like written material. Um, this is what a compound object looks like. The one previously actually was a compound object too, um, but this one is a compound object. What that means is it's basically more than one image within an object itself. So this is a birth certificate um, that's a front and back. And so you can see the front there. You can also see the back there. Um, and again, this is sort of, if you, if you type in, um, you know, Alice, Catherine, Parrish, you, that'll pull up in Indiana memory. If you type in birth certificate, it'll pop right up. Um, if you're looking for things like that. Um, and again, like with the previous one I just showed you, you could again, there's this little icon up in the upper right hand corner of the image, that little blue box that has the two arrows with it. You click on that and it'll sort of expand the image outside of the page. Then you can sort of zoom in and out. You can see things, um, in a different way and it looks pretty cool. So that's a really uh, nice new feature of Content DM Responsive. The other thing I really like about Content DM Responsive is that the icons are a lot bigger. It's a lot easier to read, which is pretty cool, which kind of leads me into my next slide, which is what metadata looks like. Um, metadata, for those who don't know, is basically data about your data. It's basically you know information about the object itself. It's a way for, for us to be able to categorize um, and sort of catalog an image, much like you would do in the library if you're cataloging things. It's the same thing, but the benefit of it is that it also allows us to sort of do faceted searching. So you can see there the time period's 1920, so you can search by 1920s to define it, or you can search by name, you can search by description, um, and then we also provide um, like what, what, what was the original collection, where is it at, um, and then rights, because um, yeah, copyright's very important when we're talking about digital collections and thinking through it. So for example, this particular object is in copyright, um, but educational use is permitted. Um, it just sort of depends. Um, some stuff that's in copyright, it's a lot harder for you to sort of reproduce. Um, but if you're doing it for like an educational purpose, like if you're doing a presentation like I am today and you use a couple images, like that's not the end of the world. The big difference is if let's say you're working on a project and you wanna publish an image in a book or you wanna publish an image in some kind of um, proprietary product, then you have to sort of reach out to the original copyright holders and sort of figure that out yourself. Um, whether or not you can do that. But this is the metadata. And again, this is something where in the new version, it's a lot easier to read, um, which is kind of nice. You can also search within the object itself. Pardon the weird random logos here on this slide. I don't know where they came from. Um, I think I was probably using them for something else and they just sort of got stuck there. So I apologize for those weird random logos. But um, this is a new collection that we've just added to Indiana Memory. This is um, some of the archives of Hoosier History Live, which is a weekly radio show here that's uh, broadcast in Indianapolis, hosted by Nelson Price. Um, it's a really wonderful radio show, and we've developed a really great partnership with them to host the archives of their show. And so this is a great example of sort of searching within the object. So you can, so this one's, this episode in particular is about early railroads in Indiana. So you can search railroads, as you can see, see railroads there, and then kind of highlights where it says railroads. 
um, which is really nice. Um, and basically, one thing that's really nice is we also have audio visual capability. So this is a, this is in podcast form, so you can actually listen to the episode itself, and then you can actually look at the show notes down below, um, which is really really nice. We also have a transcription of the show notes too, um, that's done with optical character recognition software or OCR, um, and uh, and so basically it's a little computer program that pulls through and finds the characters of what it is and basically gives you a transcription. It's not one to one; it's not absolutely perfect, but it gives a pretty good shot. It gives you pretty much if your text looks really good, if it's nice and clean, like this is you know this is something that was made last year. It's got nice clean text. Um, it'll it'll create a pretty clean transcription for you. We'll get into dealing with non-clean transcriptions when we talk about Hoosier State Chronicles, which is what we're going to do right now. So Hoosier State Chronicles is our other um, is our other major digital initiative here at the Indiana State Library, and it launched in 2011, and it was a component of the National Digital Newspaper Program, or Chronicling America. And Chronicling America is this amazing program that is a joint venture between the Library of Congress and the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's been going, I think, since 2004. And what it is, is it's this massive database of newspapers, digitized newspapers from all across the country. And our library has been involved in NDNP since 2011. That's when we did our first grant. Um, since then, we have digitized well over 300,000 pages for Chronicling America, which you can see alongside millions of pages from across the country. But then we also have Hoosier State Chronicles, which is our individual repository of, of, of material, um, where it says here it's like comprising 943,000 pages. Today it's actually closer to 1.2 million pages. Um, and again, like with Indiana Memory, we collaborate with libraries and other cultural heritage institutions to provide these resources to people. Um, we also provide that web portal, um, which you can see here on the left-hand side. This is the homepage of Hoosier State Chronicles. So it's uh, HoosierStateChronicles.org is the URL. Um, and with Indiana Memory, it's uh, IndianaMemory.org. Um, both, if you type those in, you'll get it. Um, or if you, or if you're not sure, you just type in Hoosier State Chronicles or Indiana Memory into Google. It'll pop right up. So we have nearly 300 titles today in Hoosier State Chronicles, 137,198 issues, and nearly 1.2 million pages. Um, it's text searchable, and they're downloadable. So you can download images, and you can download PDFs as well um, of the pages to save for research. And then this is Chronicling America. This is what I was mentioning earlier. It's chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. Again, if you type in Chronicling America in Google, it'll pop right up. Now this particular project that we feed into has over 17 million pages from all across the United States and sort of territories. Um, and the, the time period goes from 1789 to 1963. Um, it has uh, over 3,200 titles from 48 states, Puerto Rico and Washington, DC. And for some reason I put the, the, the URL there twice. <laughs> uh, I was probably trying to put something else. Again, this one has faceted search, it's text searchable. You can download the images as well, just like you can with um, Hoosier State Chronicles. So finding your history. So you can do a page search. So you can page, uh, search the full text. So you can search by place, time, keyword, page information, um, title, date, edition, section, page, image. Um, you can view the search results. This is if you type in New York and you kind of get a bunch of different ones, it'll highlight the terms. Again, this is all based on um, uh, text recognition that was done on, this, on these particular newspapers. Um, visual search results, you can thumbnail view, you can see the highlights, you can pan and zoom like you can with um, other ones, which is really nice, and then full screen view. Um, there's also a directory search, so if you're looking for things that maybe aren't necessarily digitized, but you want to know kind of a little bit more about newspapers throughout the state or in other different parts of the country, you can do search results. You can search by state, county, and city, and then you type in your keyword, hit search, and then it'll often show you um, different titles that might be available. Um, the nice thing about doing a search like this through the newspaper directory is if it's been digitized and it's in Chronicling America, it'll actually connect that to the newspaper listing. So, for example, one of the papers we have in um, Chronicling America is the Indianapolis Times um, from 1920 uh, to 1936. If you t type in Indianapolis Times in this newspaper directory, it'll actually take you right to not just the listing, but it'll also show you the version that's digitized that's in Chronicling America, which is a really nice feature, especially if you're kind of learning and you're like, I don't know what they have, and it's a good way of kind of searching. This is the homepage of um, Hoosier State Chronicles. 
Um, again, you know, you have, um, again, you can sort of do it by different facets. You can do it by date, you can do it by county. Um, we have the tags feature, we'll explain here in a little bit. Um, different titles, and then you can, of course, you can search. And again, you can do facet search. You can search by decade, you can search by subject, you can search by um, county, you can search by title, so on and so forth. Fat, like I said, faceted searching. So if you type in the word Hoosier in Hoosier State Chronicles, you'll get results here. And the nice thing over here on the side is you'll see those refined searches. So you can see it by publication, so you can see by the title of the paper. You can see the decade, so what era it's coming from, and then different tags. The tag feature in Hoosier State Chronicles is really cool, um, and uh, I'll explain a little bit more about that here in a second. So, so here's some search tips. Um, one thing you might want to do is you want to use quotes to limit results. So let's say for if you just type in Lou Wallace in Hoosier State Chronicles, it'll pull up everything that says Wallace, and it'll pull everything that says Lou. But if you put quotes around it, it'll pull that specifically. Um, and then you can get a much more refined search that's a little bit better for you to use and find things in. You can also search for variations on names. So there's like Lewis Wallace. Um, there was a basketball player named Homer Stonebreaker. So you can search by different names. Also in the 19th century, a lot of people went by initials. So Henry S. Lane, H. S. Lane. Um, one that I know that's also important too is like in the 19th century, especially William is one of those where it's like that, where, um, you, you know, sometimes it'll be W, but then sometimes it'll be WM period. So you want to search by the, those kinds of things too. Also, I would say, you know, kind of try to find, and this is where you can cross sort of search with like say ancestry.com where you're trying to figure out a person's name. So sometimes it'll say like TJ Johnson or something like that. Well, chances are if it's the 19th century, that TJ might more than often, more often than not stood for Thomas Jefferson. So you could type in Thomas Johnson or Thomas J. Johnson or Thomas Jefferson Johnson. You might be able to get something. Um, so it kind of pays to know a little bit about the period, and a little bit about the, about the era to get a sense of like, oh, okay, this might be this person's name or this might be this. Um, but then of course you can always use um, uh, uh, ancestry.com to get a sense of things too. You can also search by titles, so like General Wallace or like General Period Wallace, Senator By is kind of the same way. Um, Mrs. Harrison or Mrs. Fred Donaldson, like back, well, I think basically up until about the 1960s or 70s when women, especially married, when married women were described in newspapers, they weren't always described, mostly weren't described with their actual first name. A lot of times they would be like Mrs. Harrison or Mrs. Fred Donaldson. So you'd have to search by their husband's name. That's another way of being able to find things as, to, as well. Wild cards, this is kind of where the OCR is strange. So sometimes you'll have to maybe do something weird and figure that one out. And then proximity. So you will think about like, um, you know, if you type like Wallace Ben Hur, you type in John Wynn basketball, like those two things will kind of come together. Um, and the nice thing about doing it that way, too, is you can also do faceted searches where you can do the quotes around both. So if you did quotes around Lou Wallace and you did quotes around Ben-Hur and you put that in the search together, you'd get really unique results, um, which I think would be much, much more helpful to you than having to search through a bunch of stuff that's not relevant to you. Now we're going to get into talking about the sort of optical character recognition. So optical char character recognition, like we were mentioning before, um, is this fantastic technology that is an uh, automated program that basically creates text um, based on finding the individual characters and sort of doing a search based on these little individual characters. But it doesn't work perfectly. And as you can see on here on the left hand side, it doesn't look particularly good. Like you can see, oh, I didn't really get it quite right. And there's a reason for this. If you notice, like this isn't clean particularly clean text. It's hard. It's kind of hard to see. It's kind of faded out. You'll also notice that like the text on the other side bleeds through, which will also be caught. So that'll throw things off as well. The beautiful thing about Hoosier State Chronicles is that you can create a free account with your email and username. Um, all you do is you type those in, then they'll send you a confirmation email. You confirm your email and then you have an account, a free account on Hoosier State Chronicles where you can not only save things you're looking at, but you can also correct text. And our volunteers on Hoosier State Chronicles are complete, are totally amazing. They are amazing. They, they help make Hoosier State Chronicles even better than it could be. Um, and a big reason is because they can correct the text. So you can click this correct text link, and then you can, you can actually fix all of this over here. And then it can start looking like this, where you can go in and actually fix this, and you can hit save. And it really just improves researching for everyone else because, you know, if someone was looking for Philip Nicolay's fine art gallery, they couldn't really find it before, Nicolay's rather, 
um, they couldn't really find it because the OCR wasn't very good. Now that it's cleaned up, that search that will be caught in a search, and and which will be so much better for people to use. So again, this is a really wonderful thing. Um, I you know if you're ever looking for something to do um, on a day where you're like, ah, I just kind of feel like kind of shutting my brain off and doing something kind of fun like this, this is a great thing to help um, our researchers and honestly just the broader project in general. So you can save the page as a PDF and then you can print and arrange research in private lists. So you have the PDF and you can save the PDF um, and then um, you can use that for later, which is pretty fun. Um, the, the front page of this is kind of funny where he's talking about Bilbo, but it's talking about, I think, Thomas G. Bilbo is, I think, the person. Yeah, Theodore G. Bilbo. Um, but it's kind of fun because it's like Bilbo Baggins. It's kind of like Lord of the Rings. Um, it's kind of fun just to see a headline like that. It's kind of fun. Um, Oh, and one other thing I did want to mention is I wanted to talk about the tags. Let me see if I can get that back. Um, the tag feature is really, really cool. Um, let me see if I can get back here real quick. Let's see. I thought I had it here somewhere. Give me a second, guys. There we go. So, like, if you have, like, the different faceted search, you can also do it by tags. Tags is a really cool um, aspect of what we have. Actually, what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go to Hoosier State Chronicles itself and show you that. Um, let me know if you guys can still see everything. Um, so I have an account, so you can log in and then, you, then you're in. And then you'll see up here at the top you have tags. Tags are awesome. Tags are these really cool, this is a really cool feature for your state chronicles. So for example, I did a lot of research a few years ago on something on a, on a, on a group called the Reno Gang. The Reno Gang were these group of um, uh, uh, train thieves and bank robbers who were in the, the sort of southern Indiana area in the 1860s and 70s. Well, I knew through doing some of my research that some of these particular robberies didn't have names looked connected to them were actually the Reno gang. So I could click on and save this as a tag. Um, and so um, it'll actually pull up the page where I had the article. And and if you wanted to tag something, all you do is, you know, you go and you can tag, you can add a tag. This already has a tag. Um, and we have a bunch of different topics like this where people have basically made tags based on different subjects, which is really, really cool. And that's another feature you can have um, that works in, junction, in conjunction with, um, with uh, Hoosier State Chronicles. Um, I'll show you a couple other things while we're here. So, you know, it's always really important to, you know, use that, um, use those quotes, because it'll, again, give you a much better result. So you can see here, you'll see you have the different titles, you have the different years, different subjects and tags. Let's click on one. Again, it'll show you the highlighting. This is um, from the week that um, James Wilkham Riley passed away, the, the, the Hoosier poet. And so you can see here that it actually highlights what you searched in. And let's say, you know, this looks pretty good, but you want to clean it up a little bit. You can correct the text. And then you can go in and you can uh, you can select an area to correct text, and then you can go in and you can fix it, and then you hit and then you can kind of move forward. Um, it's a really great, it's a truly great um, option to kind of clean up. And you can see this one's been pretty cleaned up, um, but it's not perfect. Um, but this one has relatively clean text, so it looks pretty good. But again, you can go in and clean this out and clean this up a little bit, which is pretty cool. Um, the other thing you can do. The one feature that I use a lot is actually the date function, which is really cool. So if you pick a particular year, let's just pick like 1920, and we'll pick November, 100 years ago today. Um, and you can go to November, let's say 25th, November 25th, 1920, and you can pull up the individual issue because it's set up like a calendar feature, and it'll show you all of the titles of the particular day, which is great, and you can click on it. So this is a newspaper, of the Indian, this is a copy of the Indianapolis News from 100 years ago today, um, which is pretty cool, you know, or 150 years ago today, or 50 years ago today. Um, I like to do those a lot. 
Um, you get some of these classic Gar Williams editorial cartoons on the front page. These are a big highlight of the Indianapolis News around that era, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, you can search by date. You can also search by county. So all, here's all the different counties. If you're looking like, I really want to look at stuff from, you know, uh, I want to look at stuff from Jefferson County. And then you click on that. And it'll show you all the different titles we have. And then you can kind of look at this. And you can look at it. We, we add new things all the time. Any, Hoosier State Chronicles is really um, defined by kind of two broad things. One, we do long runs of newspapers. So like we have... The Indianapolis Times from 1920 to 1952. We have the um, Jewish Post from the 1930s up until 2005. We have the Indianapolis Recorder, which is the major African-American newspaper of, of Indianapolis from, I think, the 1880s or 90s all the way up to 2005. We have all kinds of big, long runs. But then we also have like kind of interesting and sort of unique titles that are sort of really unique to Hoosier State Chronicles because they haven't really been done anywhere else. Um, one of them is a fun one that I really like called Name It and Take It which is this kind of fun little newsletter thing that was published in Smithville, Indiana. And, uh, and it's just called Name It and Take It. And it's just like the little local news. Um, but it's pretty cool. And uh, I like that a whole lot. While I've got you here and I'm kind of showing it to you in real time, I'm also going to show you guys Indiana memory. And kind of show you what Indiana memory looks like and work, what it works like in real time. So you have the home page. Um, again, you can search by collections across Indiana. Um, oh, that's right. It doesn't let me do that. Oh, I'm going to have to fix that link. But anyway, you have contributors. Wow. Some of our links are dying today. Sorry about that, guys. Anyway, usually you can, you can, um, do, you can pull up things. So... We're going to search James Wickham Riley again, and we're going to pull up a bunch of different stuff here. So again, you have this faceted search where it's like different collections that we have, um, different decades, and then different repositories. Um, and the repositories tend to be like the institution, and then the collection tends to be a specific collection. Um, so like the James Wickham Riley collection within IEPY, or the James Wickham Riley collection within Indiana Album, so on and so forth. Um, and so let's just click on one. And actually, I want to show you guys one from us. Let's go with this one. So this is from our actual Content DM collection. So again, the nice thing about the new version of Content DM is it'll actually shrink the image down so you can see it on your screen. But as you can see, it's kind of hard to read. So then you can click this here, and it'll actually blow it up for you. And this particular image is not kind of clear but oh Christine that's amazing I didn't know that that's really cool oh that's incredible I'll read this for the everyone so she said name it and take it was created by Ralph B Carter who ran telephone exchange with his girls at switchboard sharing gossip they heard over wires and then printed it that's incredible I was always curious why it was printed because I always thought it was the, the most unique thing I've ever seen and I was like, it, it has like a very different size and it's like, it's just such a unique thing. Um, I loved it. So thank you for that extra information. That's super helpful. I've always thought it was such a unique title and now I have a little bit more information about it. That's great. Um, here we go. This is a good one. So you can go to this. And our friends over at Digital in in India have also switched over to Content DM Responsive so it looks the same. So again, you can, so again, it'll have the information here, the metadata here, and then if you pull this, then you can zoom in and out, which is really nice. You get a good clean image. And uh, I think you, this one, you don't have the option of, of um, downloading, but you can print it. Um, one little trick, though, I will say is though, even though you can't actually download an image, the, the new content DM is actually a lot better um where you can um a lot of times if you right click on the image itself it'll actually it'll actually pull up and you can download it this way it's not the full image it's not the the exact image size but if you wanted it and they didn't give you the download option you can do that old content dm you can do that it would do this tiling thing where you can download the whole download the whole image um but but yeah now you can which is kind of nice yeah this is a terrific image this is a great one um I love it. It's really, really fun. You've got the kids there and the little dog. It's very cute. 
Um, this was a picture I think that was taken by William Herschel. And so, and then we often do like a description. We've got our subjects and then time periods, write statements. So um, it's a copyright undetermined. And then I'm trying to think of other things I want to show you because our, our like links are weird right now, guys. So I'm sorry, I can't show you as much as I want to. But when the contributors is actually working, it would show you all the different contributors and you can search by that too. So if you just wanted to see like a person's broader collection, you can do that too. Um, a couple other things I will show you too that I think are kind of important are the Digital Public Library of America and the Indiana State Library Digital Collections page. Um, I'm gonna show you both of those. Um, hold on here. I never remember the actual URL. So I just I usually just Google things if I don't ever remember the. Uh... Okay, we're gonna start with the Digital Public Library of America. We have an incredible partnership with the Digital Public Library of America. It's kind of like Chronicling America, how we have like some of our newspapers in that broader database that's like from all across the country. DPLA is like that with Indiana Memory. So we, um, we are a partner with the Digital Public Library of America or DPLA that has nearly 42 million images, texts, and videos and from all across the United States. Um, and so when you search in this one, let's say we search James Whitcomb Riley, not only will you get stuff from us, but you'll also get stuff from other places like the Heinz History Center, the New York Public Library, National Portrait Gallery, so on and so forth. Then you can also refine it by location too, or by partner. So we've got Indiana Memory, so you can search Indiana Memory stuff, and then here's our individual things that we have in Indiana Memory that we then feed into um, the Digital Public Library of America. Again, it's just another wonderful resource that we like to share with people um, that is an even bigger sort of playground for you to play in, in terms of finding images or finding manuscript collections or so on and so on and so forth. So I really love the DPLA. I'm very proud of our partnership. We've been partners with DPLA since 2015 and I'm really proud of the partnership that we've developed with them over the last few years. The next thing I'll show you guys is our state library digital collections. So within Indiana Memory itself, we actually have our own collections with the State Library. This is the stuff from our own internal collections that we've digitized. It's from our um, manuscripts collection. It's from our rare books, rare, rare books and manuscripts collection, the Indiana Division, um, and uh, I think our Federal Documents Division. And so you can search different things like trade catalogs, genealogy, letters, photographs, um, and then often shows like some of the newest things we've added in. Um, and again, this is just another resource for you to use, um, and it's digitalcollections.library.in.gov. DPLA is super easy. It's just dp.la, and it'll pull right, pull right up. Um, so we can click on maybe one of this. So like, let's, like, our broadside collection is really cool. So and this pulls right up, and then you can kind of see it. Um, again, just beautiful stuff. I mean, I, I mean, we... I'm so excited about these broadsides, especially now with the new image, the way the images display in content DM now is like so much better. You can really zoom in, get a really good, good look at these materials. Um, really good, beautiful scan. Um, just some really great stuff that we've got here in, in uh, our state library collections. Um, and that is about it. Um, I'm gonna pull up my presentation again. Is there a version of this presentation available in tutorials for using the site? Um, Don, no, but it's something we can certainly develop. Um, I'm happy to like maybe do like a recorded version of this. I know this will be recorded. Maybe that'll be it. Um, but but yeah. Um, let me see. But yeah, I you know, but it's been. But I want to. I just want to thank you all very very much for. Um, for listening to my presentation today. And, uh, and I'm really excited about um, the future of these digital initiatives and kind of growing them and, and having them uh, become even bigger and better than they are now. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much, Justin. This is Courtney Brown from the Indiana State Library, just stepping in for Laura. She's having a little bit of tech issues. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and put that in the chat box. 
Um, someone had a question about accessing the re recording. That will be sent out um, after the presentation and then it'll be up on the um, Indiana State Library's archived webinar page. Um, someone mentioned that Indiana Memory is great for programming research. Yes, it is. Uh, it's awesome. Um, I, I use it all the time for different materials, for sure. It's great. Someone is asking OCR for handwritten materials. That's a great question. So at this stage, unfortunately, there isn't really good OCR for handwritten stuff. Um, there is, but the software is very, very expensive. Um, and it's not something that's within our sort of current means to do. Generally, what we do with those kinds of situations is we just do it by hand. Um, so I'm actually processing a collection right now that has some of those handwritten materials. And basically, I'm just reading them and then transcribing them myself. Um, so again, I know that's a bit of an arduous process. There are some OCR software programs out there for handwritten stuff, but they tend to be they tend to be expensive, and you still, at the end of the day, don't get as good as you would if you just did it yourself. Christine is asking, can you explain how DPLA gets funding from partners or in general? Sure, that's a good question. So, um, in terms of how DPLA works, basically you pay a membership fee to DPLA to be a member. With us at the library, I can't speak for other institutions, but with the library, it's just an internal contract that we have with them. Um, and a lot of times to get the kind of funding to be a part of DPLA, um, the best thing to do, if you're, let's say you're a local library and you want to be a part of DPLA, you know, the best thing is to basically create a partnership with us. Um, so if you're interested in doing a digital collection in your local library, um, you know, contact me. We'll set something up. We can create a, an Indiana memory collection for you um, that then feeds into DPLA. And that's at no cost to you. Um, so if you're interested in being having some of your stuff in, Indi in Indiana memory and DPLA, um, we provide that as a service through the state library. So um, that's a really good way of doing it, too. Great. Thanks, Justin. We have another question. Did you cover how libraries can get their collections on Indiana memory? Oh, I didn't. Um, this was mostly about um, just kind of how to use it, but I can certainly go into that. So I kind of talked a little bit about that with DPLA. So with libraries who are interested in being a part of Indiana Memory or Hoosier State Chronicles, the best thing is to start reaching out to me and we can start building that partnership. Um, the, real good, the way to really start this process is to um, kind of have a chat with me, kind of interested in what you're doing, um, what you'd like to do. And then we sort of start putting together a game plan. So for example, do you have funding? If you don't, then maybe we can help you um, get a Library um, Services and Technology Act grant, an LSTA grant here through the library. Um, it's a digitization grant that's up to $15,000 that you can then use to do a digital project. Um, and then basically what we do is we, um, we have you start working on digitizing materials. You'll start doing the metadata and so on and so forth. Um, we will provide you with content EM software for free. We'll also provide you with training for free. So if you're interested in doing content EM collection. Hoosier State Chronicles is a little bit different because it's the metadata schema is completely different than content EM. So it requires a little bit more, but basically that one requires a vendor. Um, to do the metadata and the scanning because it's just it's so much more labor intensive. So it's a lot easier just to contract that out. Again, an LSTA grant will go a long way to doing something like that and we can help process that and do that for you. Um, but back to Indiana Memory, basically what we do is we, we set up that partnership, we do the training and then you start doing your collections. Um, and I work with you one on one or my colleague Jill Black will work with you all um, to make sure your collections are as best as they can be. Um, then we have them harvested for Indiana memory and they can be searched within Indiana memory for everyone. And then if you provide us with the option, um, we can also harvest it into DPLA. Um, so yeah, so if you're a la local library, you're interested in sort of getting into this space, um, please contact me in my email, um, justclark at library.in.gov. Um, that's J-U-S-C-L-A-R-K at library.in.gov. And we'll get the ball rolling. We'll kind of start about what are your needs? What are you interested in doing? Um, we also do right now because of COVID, it's a little bit more difficult, but we do offer um, uh, um, uh, equipment lending. So we have a couple scanners we tend to lend out, but um, but we but we don't we're not doing that right now, mainly just because one of the scanners is up at Eckerd Public Library and we because of COVID, we're not going to go grab it anytime soon, basically. But we do do equipment lending and then we also help you kind of figure out what's best for your needs. Great. We have a lot of people thanking you for the great information that you're sharing. 
Uh, we have another question. Can you tell us a little bit about teacher resources? Sure. So the teacher resources are mainly, I'm trying to think if I can pull up the link. Let me see if I can pull it up because I don't want to tell you something I'm not 100% sure of. Let me see if it works. Yeah. So um, if you guys can see my screen here, so we have the different teacher resources. We have like best practices. So Brian basically kind of provides like how can teachers use primary sources, um, thinking about historical thinking and different kinds of things. The Indiana Historical Bureau, which I'm part of now, we actually have um, resources for our historical marker program. There's also online tutorials through the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian. Um, again, more resources for how to teach with primary sources. Um, we also have sort of lesson plans from Indiana Memory Collections. And then we also have other ones from Ball State University um, based on like different grades and so on and so forth. Um, but those are kind of the, some of the teacher resources we have. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the link into the chat for people to kind of look at and get a sense of what um, what we've got there. Great. And then we have another question. Are copyright and use permission statements becoming more standard and clear? In the early days, they were all over the place, leaving end users confused. Oh, that's a terrific question. I'm so glad somebody asked this. So I'm going to show you something. Yes, they are becoming more uniform all the time. And a big reason for that is our partnership with DPLA. Since we've uh, in, uh, embarked on our partnership with DPLA five years ago, um, DPLA realized as they were building their collection of stuff from across the country that for every collection and for every item, there was like a different copyright statement and it was really all over the place. So they developed along with a bunch of other libraries, they basically developed writestatements.org, which I've pulled up here. I'm going to also put this link in the chat. Um, and writestatements.org provides uniform write statement URIs. They're kind of like URLs, but they're more permanent. And so you have different statements. So mostly based on um, things that are in copyright, things that are not in copyright, and things that are other, you're basically not sure. So with in copyright, most things are going to be in copyright, and then you'll use this in copyright URI that's standard and uniform. So for example, let me pull up something from Indiana Memory that I know is in copyright. So I think the Deb stuff is or some of it is anyway. Um, actually, let me go more with something else. Um, I'm trying to think here. Hmm. Let's see. Um, let's see. I've been working on this Cool and Schmidt family collection, so I've been down digitizing things. Um, this is part of our genealogy collection. I think some of this is in, I think some of this is in copyright. Yes, this one's in copyright. Here we go. So this is an image from the Cool and Schmidt family collection that I digitized. And you'll see here, we've got the right statements URI. When you click on that, it takes you right to the rightstatements.org. And it actually provides you a full description of what something in copyright is. And then we also have as, as a copyright notice here as well. And again, the text for the copyright notice matches the right statement. So again, we say in copyright, like we don't say. Um, uh, and so that's kind of that. Um, and then Kara says she knows Eden Coolidge, but yes, I got the collection from her. Um, we worked really hand in hand. I was down there last year around the fall and when we were working on uh, stuff for Jefferson Township Public Library and she gave me this collection and so we've been working on it. It's been great. Um, yeah, she was incredible. Yeah, and she had such a wealth. She had done so much great research on, on her family to really give you a good, um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, but yes, this is this is how you know. And again, like the thing that's lovely about writestatements.org is that like, again, it gives you a certain level of uniformity. And so that once you learn how to use it, you'll have a sense of how to use it. So you've got your in copyright, you've got no copyright, which, you know, generally most things are you're going to have that are no copyright are going to be no copyright United States. And then you're going to use... Um, Lori says our other link is not working. Uh, you know what, Lori? I think what's going on right now with our links is that um, there's being there. I think there's a our web or like our web CMS is changing in the state library, and so I think a lot of things are kind of breaking with the switch. 
So I apologize for any technical difficulties anybody has with the links. Um, hopefully they'll be resolved soon. Um, but back to copyright. So basically you'll use these uniform statements. Most of the time you're going to use, you know, you know, copyright, no copyright United States, or you're going to use in copyright, or you'll use like in copyright educational use permitted. This is if a patron has donated something and they provided this as something in particular or non-commercial use. Um, but most of the time you'll just use in copyright because it's the nice big tent. Um, and then sometimes you're like, I don't know. So sometimes you'll put like copyright undetermined or copyright not evaluated, no known copyright. Um, and so, yeah, uh, we were really hoping to do a copyright workshop in this year. We were going to bring in Greg Cram from the New York Public Library, but unfortunately COVID happened and it kind of dashed all that. So hopefully we'll do a copyright workshop uh, either next year or the year after um, that kind of goes into all of this and wor walks you through all of this. Um, that will be a day workshop and we'll actually provide real world examples that you can learn um, and kind of work through some of this stuff. Because this is one of the trickier parts, I think, of doing digital collections. But I think if you can figure this out, um, then, you know, I think you're in a long, like you've, you've figured out one of the harder parts. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Justin. This is great information. Uh, this presentation has been recorded. As a reminder, if you're watching an archived recording of this presentation, information on how to obtain your TLU is in the video's description on YouTube. Um, everyone who signed up for this presentation will get this emailed uh, once we get it uh, uploaded to YouTube. And we'll go ahead and stop the recording.